Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is October 15, 2021, and as you may be aware, I started running a poll a few months ago about attitudes towards China. This seems to be a contentious issue, and I wanted to get a better sense of who was saying what and why. So I posted a YouTube video April 27, 2021. I also posted the same questions on a number of socialism-oriented Reddit boards, and then I made another video a few months later to follow up and just basically generate another round of responses. All in all, this ran from April 27, 2021 to September 25th, 2021. That's when I finally gathered up all the responses. So I got 131 in total. I think that I missed a few of them, but anyway, that's what wound up being counted was 131. I'm not completely done working with the data set and for reasons I'll explain in just a second, but you can see the questions on the screen. So basically what I asked for were five responses. The first question was, do you believe that China is socialist or otherwise sincerely working towards socialist if they're not quite socialist yet? Question two was why or why not in your own words? So this is more of a qualitative question and I got anywhere from one or two sentences to one or two pages there. And that's not the kind of thing that you can quantitatively, you know, it's not yes or no, or it's not a number. So that's something that I'm going to have to break down a lot more. And that's going to take still a significant amount of time. Uh, so we'll come back to question two. Question three, what are your politics? ML, Trotskyist, ANCOM, Social Democrat, etc. Number four, in what year did you adopt your current politics? So how long have you been whatever you say you are today? And fifth, in what country do you live? So in this video, I'm going to show you a couple of graphs that just have some very basic tallies from each of these categories. And I want to note that this is an informal survey. It is not a scientific poll. So when I go through the analyses, I'm not going to be, you know, looking for statistical significance and things like that. We're not getting into p-values. It just doesn't matter because it's an informal survey. That said, I'll try to make this as interesting as possible. So in this video, I have some preliminary findings. Where this is going to get, I think, more interesting is when I'm able to break down all the responses for question two, more of the qualitative side. And that just is going to, you know, like I said, there's 131 responses, some of which are two pages long. And basically what I will be doing in that part of the analysis is more of a content analysis, like coding different topics that come up. And then, you know, how many times did people reference uh, dictatorship of the proletariat or commodity production or foreign policy or whatever, whether it's, you know, somebody who said, yes, China is socialist or no, they aren't. Uh, I wanted to, you know, there's things that you can do qualitatively to break that down. And I'll be doing more of that, but really that's going to be a much longer process. All right, so anyway, let's get to some of the very basic findings so far. Before I do any of the multivariable analysis, we are going to look at just tallies. So here's question one. Do you believe that China is socialist or sincerely working towards socialism? A majority, 54.20% said yes. That was 71 out of the 131 responses to that question. Then a small sliver were unsure. That was 6.87% or nine of the respondents. And I want to note that eight of those were just like a flat, I'm not sure or neither. And then one of them said unsure, but leaning yes. I did count it as an unsure though. And then no was 38.93% or 51 responses out of the 131. Moving ahead to question three, what are your politics? And I gave, for example, ML, Trotskyist, ENCOM, SOCDEM, etc. You can see that about half, just slightly over half, said Marxist-Leninist. So in that category, most of the respondents just wrote the letters ML, or they wrote Marxist-Leninist, the words. However, there were three respondents who wrote something else, which I counted in this group. One said ML parentheses Soviet, one said ML parentheses Hojaist, comma, Juche, and I counted that as ML. And finally, there was somebody who said communist, and I counted that as ML. So, 
just to be transparent about the methodology. So the next category in terms of quantity was Marxist, Leninist, Maoist. Now, there was a greater range of responses which I counted in this category. The majority said MLM. Then there was an ML-MZT, Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought. Then there was an ML with Maoist influence. Then there were two who said Maoist, one who said Maoist leaning, one was Marxist with Lenin and Mao, and finally MLM-thirdworldist-demarcist-fourthpositionist. Quite the, quite the mix there. Anyway, so that was the Marxist-Leninist-Maoist category. The next largest group was Trotskyist. So there were 12, that is the large yellow section there. And true to form for Trotskyism, there was an even greater variety of responses here. This is what I counted as Trotskyist. Only one person actually just simply wrote Trotskyist. The rest were as follows. Again, one Trotskyist, one Trotskyism, parentheses, Jerry Healy, one Trotskyism, parentheses, TFFI, one Trotskyist plus anarchist, one Trotskyist dash Cliffite. One person said, when I live in the first world, I'm a Leninist dash Trotskyist. When I live in the third world, I'm a Maoist dash Che Guevarian. Okay. One Marxist with Trotsky, one Bolshevik Leninist slash Trot slash Canaanite, one Leninist. Why did I put the Leninist in this category? Because usually I found when people make that distinction, they're deliberately not saying Marxist Leninist, they're saying Leninist. That's usually a Trot. Anyway, there were also two, uh, well, slightly different. One was Marxist with Lenin, one was Marxism with Lenin. Again, I counted them as Trotskyists for the same reason. Usually when people say, I'm a Marxist and Leninist, it's more of a nod to Trotskyism, deliberately trying to avoid the Stalinist, quote-unquote, formulation of ML. And then finally, there was an undecided leaning towards Trotskyism, and I counted that as a Trotskyist. So that's who ended up in that category. To me, that was the most accurate way of doing that. So the next category is basically non-denominational Marxist or socialist. I'm aware that some of this can be Trotskyist as well. Some of it also can be like leftcom who don't agree with Lenin or Trotsky. So I made this its own category. Anyway, what we have in the non-denominational category, we have a Marxism. We have a Marxism unsure, two Marxist, two said non-denominational, three just said socialist, and one said undecided Marxism. So that's who ended up in the non-denominational Marxist or socialist category. Next, anarchist. So again, there were 10 responses recorded as anarchist. Three of these were ANCOM. One was anarcho-syndicalist. One was libertarian socialist. One was Libsoc-Luxembourg. And one said individualist anarchist. So by far, those were social anarchists, anarcho-communists, and things like that. Although the one sounded like more of a black flag, individualist anarchist. Next, Demsox, democratic socialist. This was more of the Bernie type. And there are seven of them. And they all just wrote democratic socialist. So there you go. Uh, next, we have the NA category, which is no answer or none asshole if you're feeling edgy. Um, people who just didn't respond to this. Two were populist, and um, one of these people said populist, one of them said independent, and I asked them what that meant, and anyway, I wound up putting them in the populist category just based off of those answers. Finally, we have three other tendencies which only had one respondent in them. The first is council communist. There were one of those. Another one was Sankaraist slash Sabukwaist, Pan-African Socialism. That was the answer. I wrote it here as Sankaraist, Pan-Africanist. And finally, we had a Spanglerist, or a believer in guild socialism. So that's what we had for tendencies, and that represents, in total, the 131 respondents who gave an answer on question one. 
So next on to question four, in what year did you adopt your current politics? We see that while there is a range, there's also a huge clustering of responses in the late 2000s and on. So there's one response that said 1965, a couple from the late 70s, one from the 80s, one from 2000, one from 2005, and then pretty much everything else is 2008 and on. Why is that? Well, it could be that a lot of the audience is in their 20s and 30s, and that's when they became politically conscious. It's also possible that 2008 got people thinking a lot more in terms of socialism because of the worldwide economic crash that the capitalists told us you know, would never happen, and they've worked all the bugs out of their system, and there wouldn't be any more crises. Keep in mind, revisionists have been saying that since Lenin's time over 100 years ago. So anyway, yeah, there was one response from the 60s, a couple of people. I had to make a few inferences here, uh, like people who said, since I was 10 or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think that the 1985 was a guess. Um, it was, you know, since I was born or something like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to guess you're 35 years old. So take those with a grain of salt. Um, but that said, the responses from... 2000, I think it was 2015 and on, are nearly 75% of the entire group. And then responses from 2017 and on are 50%. So what does this mean? Uh, well, it seems to me to be pretty clear that more and more people are becoming interested in socialism. Now, it could be also that the people who participated in this poll, who watched Socialism for All, uh, you know, it just happens to be those people who became most interested in Marxism in the last two or three years, and this is a baby step on their journey, or something to that effect. That said, I saw in reading through, and we'll get into this more in the qualitative video, which is yet to come. It'll be the last thing that I put out in the series on this video. This is the basic tally video. I'm going to do, I think, a second video that has some sort of cross-variable analysis. I'll explain that after I get done with questions four and five. Um, and then the, the you know full qualitative video that gets into question two. But basically, what I saw in these answers to question four was a lot of descriptions of, well, I've been political since 2010, but I started as a democratic socialist, and then I became an anarchist, and then I became an ML in 2018. Like, that would be a very typical thing. I think it is safe to say that more people are becoming Marxist now than were becoming Marxist 10 or 20 years ago, for sure. Uh, that's, again, something I'll get into more in the later qualitative video, but I think that that's a fair assumption. And that's very encouraging, you know, uh, that more and more people would be becoming, you know, taking a hard left approach to politics. Um, you know, I personally was introduced to Marx in the late 90s. But, you know, I had kind of a revisionist teacher on that. And it was, you know, oh, revolution doesn't work, you know, evolution, not revolution and all that. I was like, yeah, whatever. Okay. So I kind of went on. And then, you know, Bush and Cheney started their shit. And I was like, I should really get into politics and uh, found my way back to Marx eventually. So, yeah, uh, that kind of progression is typical. And like I said, I'll deal with that separately in the qualitative video. But I do think it's safe to say this isn't just um, that S4A is necessarily just a magnet for people, um, you know, who've just gotten into Marxism. I'm sure there's some of that. But, you know, look at this. Uh, and we're going to see in question five, most people were from the USA. So it was less common for people in the USA to be interested in Marxism from 1965 to 2008. Then what happens? The economy falls out. Everybody stops talking about terrorism, which had been, you know, today's secret word all through the Bush-Cheney years to the economy, the economy, the economy. And uh, that's exactly what this graph shows. It's 2008 on. There's a steady increase in... Uh, interest in Marxist and Marxist-Leninist politics. So there's definitely 
a lot of room there for additional research and we can't draw super firm conclusions uh but you know a general hypothesis or basis for additional research questions sort of lends itself right there of course again this was a poll about china i just asked the question about how long have you had your politics more in reference to that uh you know specifically the china question and it didn't really ask people why did you become a marxist or whatever your politics are so again room for additional research there let's move on to question number five which is in what country do you live so you can see that a very slight majority rounding up to 51 percent were from the usa or puerto rico i mentioned puerto rico just because it's not a state and two people were specific that they were from puerto rico uh, there was also a response that just said imperial core i'm assuming that that is the usa Beyond that, a few people said South or Deep South. One person said Georgia, one said Midwest. Otherwise, everything just said USA. So there's not really too much more that I can do, uh, you know, in terms of detail there. But basically, half the respondents were in the USA or Puerto Rico. And then 18%, 17.69, said that they were from Europe or Russia. So specifically, three were from Russia. And then uh, there were a range of European countries, Austria, Czech Republic, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, one just said Scandinavia, Slovenia, Spain, and Sweden were represented there. Moving on to the next category, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand were 13%, just over 13.08%. And the majority of these were from the UK, Next was Canada, three from Australia, and one from New Zealand. Also, one of the people from Canada said that they were born in China, but then moved to Canada when they were nine or ten. So that's that one. The next category is Caribbean and Latin American countries. So these included countries such as Argentina, Brazil. One just said the Caribbean, two said Latin America, and there was a Mexican respondent. And I included that person in this category. So the next category is the Middle East and Africa. So this included Morocco, Yemen, occupied Azania, or South Africa. Turkey, I put in this category. I know that Turkey sometimes is considered somewhat European. Anyway, I included them in the Middle East category here and the UAE. Finally, there is Asia. There were just four respondents from Asia, 3.08%. Two from India, one from China, one from Sri Lanka. Finally, just over 5% of the people who gave answers did not answer the in what country do you live question. So those are the basic tallies. Now you know where people are coming from in a variety of ways, literally what country they live in, in what year they adopted their current politics. Although again, you know, take that with a grain of salt because a lot of times people are like, well, I became a Marxist in 2019 but prior to that, I was an anarchist for three years or something like that, and so on. So the last thing I'm going to do in this preliminary video is give a tease of what is coming in the next video, where we start to dig a little deeper into the qualitative side. So let's do a breakdown of question one by the respondents' politics. So here you see a pie chart. This is self-identified Marxist-Leninists only on question one. Do you believe that China is socialist or sincerely working towards socialism? The overwhelming majority, 76.10%, said yes. A few, 5.97%, said neither. And then 14.93% said no. So more than three quarters of self-identified Marxist-Leninist respondents to this survey said yes. They believe that China is socialist or if it's not socialist yet, they are working towards it. So the next largest political group was Maoists. And again, this is people who wrote MLM or Maoist or something along those lines involving the word Mao in there somewhere. And the vast majority of them, two thirds said no, 66.67%. 20% said neither. And then a minority 13.33% said yes. So very few yeses. A lot of no's, and I think the largest chunk of neither's or 
unsure, you know, undecided is that orange. So Maoists tend to be pretty down on China being socialist, we can see here. So the next largest group was Trotskyists. And this is a little bit closer to an even split. 50% said no. 41.67% said yes. And then the rest of that missing half said neither, 8.33%. So half said no. And then uh, the other half, most said yes. And then a few said neither. Then we have non-denominational Marxists, people who just said Marxist or general socialist, something like that. And this was an even split, 50% yes, no neithers, 50% no. Then on to anarchists, overwhelming majority said no, 70%, no neithers, and then 30% yes. Then we come to democratic socialists, again, overwhelming majority said no, 71.43%, and about 15, 14% said neither, and the same amount, 14.29% said yes. So total, you have about 30% saying yes or neither, unsure, and over 70% saying no. Then populists. There were only two of these, and one said yes and one said no, so it's 50-50. Then the smaller tendencies. These were the guild socialist, the council communist, and the Sankaraist. All three of them said no. Finally, the last group are the NAs, and uh, these are people who did not identify their political identification or orientation. And three, there were four of them. Three of them said no, 75%. One said yes, 25%. So 75 no, 25% yes. So what can we say about this? Well, basically, uh, Marxist-Leninists were the only group who believed that China is socialist or is sincerely working towards socialism. And they were pretty strong in that preference. Again, 76% thought that. And of course, Marxist-Leninists were the largest group by far represented in this survey. Therefore, they were able to swing the survey in general towards the positive. I mean, that makes sense. Socialism for All is a Marxist-Leninist-leaning channel. We strive for Marxist unity wherever that's possible, but... Again, that is generally our orientation. But that said, every other political ideology represented here, and again, this is self-identified Maoists, Marxist-Leninist Maoists, Trotskyists, etc. Every other group, uh, at least 50% of those groups, and in many cases more than 50% of them, thought that China is not socialist and not sincerely working towards socialism. Again, in the qualitative video, we're going to get into, well, then if that's not the case, you know, why not? And what do you think they are? We'll get to that in the later video, which is going to take me a lot longer to sift through all that data and do something intelligible with it. In the meantime, I think that these are some interesting preliminary findings, just some basic counts and a little bit of cross variable analysis. But I'd like to leave you with one general thought. And this is not only my own thinking, but I also saw that it was represented in many of the responses to question two, you know, why or, why or why not do you think that China is socialist? Thinking that China is not socialist does not necessarily equate to a lack of support for China, particularly in the face of U.S. military aggression. I saw a lot of people who didn't necessarily think that China was socialist, but that they also had some qualified or critical support for China, particularly in the situation that they now find themselves in, which is possibly becoming the global economic leader in the next 10 or 15 years, and maybe putting the U.S.-led imperial effort that's been going on for the longest time out of business, or starting to, like in the near future. So this could be really significant. Uh, I'm going to cover Paul Cockshot. I mean, he's not the only person talking about it. Did, I thought, a very good analysis of what a China, US, UK, Australia confrontation might look like. Spoiler alert, China would probably win and the US and Brits would have to back down, which could signal a change in the balance of power in the world, which could have many positive but complicated and not easily foreseeable consequences that we can pick out right now. That is 
really going to be a monumental thing if and when it happens. I think also that it is likely. Um, so I'll be talking about that. China really is in a very interesting and crucial position. Um, whether or not you think it's socialist, I think it's very hard to argue that China's model of development, whether you think that they could be more benevolent or more generous towards some of the countries that they have agreements with, I think it's hard to argue that their model is more predatory than the IMF, World Bank, U.S. bullshit that has been going on for decades and decades, let alone the overt colonialism that preceded the sort of neocolonialism and debt traps that we're in now. I think it's very hard to make an argument that China would somehow be worse. I think it would be significantly better. And uh, I'm excited about it because I've been wondering for a long time, when is somebody going to be able to stand up to the United States? And when I started asking that question 20 years ago, the start of the war on terror, which was, you know, around the time of my general political awakening and starting to wonder such questions in general, uh, China was not really on the board in the same way. Their economy has just grown many fold since that time. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the countries such as the U.S., which opened factories there, are now very concerned that they can't put China back in the box. So anyway, there's a lot that can come out of that. Along the same lines of this general, you know, thinking China is socialist or not, uh, thinking that it isn't doesn't necessarily mean that you don't support it. Um, there was a debate recently between Jason Unruh and kind of a Caleb Maupinite named Dust James. I'm probably going to do a commentary on that probably this weekend. It's probably going to be a really long video because the thing itself is three hours. It's probably, with the commentary, it'll be about five hours probably. But I thought that this was probably the most civil and listenable such discussion uh, that has occurred in a while. And I think it was really, to me, one of the key things that emerged out of that discussion was Jason Unruh flat out said, I support China. He just doesn't think it's socialist. I mean, it's more than he just doesn't think it's socialist. But even China's critics, you know, over on the general left here, often support China in the face of the opposition that it is facing the world around. Because honestly, we saw what happened when the USSR was destroyed. And it was. I mean, it had internal problems, but it also was definitely sabotaged. This was catastrophic for the global peace movement, because as soon as the USSR came down, the US-led Western imperialist forces basically started licking their chops in the 90s. They made their plans for globalization, and then they went on the war path. Within 10 years, the war on terror started. And that's what they will do in the absence of someone who is capable, some force that is capable of standing up to them. So if China falls, it, I mean, it would just be unmitigated disaster, I think, or nearly unmitigated disaster. So all important things to keep in mind, this is going to be an ongoing discussion. And here at Socialism for All, of course, our channel is rooted in the Marxist audiobooks. We're basically teaching Marxism, Marxism-Leninism. And one of the guideposts for the overall work that we're doing here on the channel is something called the Basic Marxism-Leninism Study Guide. It's a curriculum put together by an organization called Movimiento Anti-Imperialista, MAI. And uh, we haven't really gotten into the Mao portion of that, but we're about to. And I'm going to be doing a lot more readings on China this month, next month, December, and into 2022. We're going to do Mao. We're going to do Deng Xiaoping. We are going to do the works to get more into that subject. I've just been, you know, trying to progress through this in some kind of sane way. So we've been doing a lot of Lenin and early USSR stuff to date. But we're going to get into, you know, later Soviet Union, into the Chinese Revolution, and on uh, pretty soon with the audiobooks. Uh, so you can expect a lot more of this to be discussed on the channel going into next year, tying it in with the readings, and so forth. I hope all of that is interesting to you. Please make sure to subscribe, click the notifications bell, and keep checking in on the channel as we put up more content. 
Uh, I have about 10 audiobooks that I want to get through that I've already started. And then we'll be starting on probably about two or three dozen Mao things, like almost in a row. I'm sure I'll mix it up a little bit. But uh, like I said, we just have been focusing more on the sort of 1890s, 1900s, 19 teens, particularly with Lenin. And, uh, you know, we'll be getting into Mao, which is more of writings from the 1920s and 30s. We'll be doing Stalin alongside that after the death of Lenin and the formation of the USSR and so on. Anyway, also one brief note, uh, I mentioned Paul Cockshot. I'm aware, as people have brought to my attention, I mean, I like Paul Cockshot's economic analyses. He does some very interesting PowerPoints. He unfortunately also has some really awful UK boomer turf stuff going on. I mean, he had a whole section on his website labeled gender, which has really awful turf takes, uh, anti-trans, transphobic stuff. It's not good. Uh, I did personally ask him to take it down and issue an apology. We'll be checking back in with that. And I'll say a little bit more about that when I do the particular video on Cockshot's analysis of China versus Australia, UK, US. So just wanted to say that again for anyone listening. I am aware of the issue. And I did directly ask Cockshot on Twitter, hey, can you take this down? This really just has no place in the movement right now. So that is underway. All right. Thanks for listening. And do please leave a comment below. Remember, there's more analysis coming from the data set, which came out of the survey. So expect a lot more interesting tidbits. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. So thanks to all the patrons for that. If you'd like to help out without a donation, click like, subscribe, notifications bell, leave a comment for the algorithm, and maybe share the videos on your social media. All of that helps to boost the channel, helps more people to see the content and get involved with the conversation. Ultimately, whatever it is that you do to spread the word about socialism online and in your community, thanks for doing it. Start a project of your own. Join an organization if there's a good one in your area, and we'll catch you in the next video.